morning. I'm Dave Scott with the National Center for Propria Technology, NCAT. And today we're here at Ranch Land Pack in Butte, Montana. We're going to go through the uh, sequence of events that where an animal is killed and cut up and, and cut and wrapped for you today. And that animal is a lamb. Um, I want to do some brief introductions first and a thank you to, to Justin Fisher, who's the owner of this plant. And uh, we'll go from there. On my left here is Justin Fisher. He's the owner of Ranchland Packing in Butte. And his head butcher is Wayne Worley. And these guys are going to show us how the lambs are broken and cut up and cut and wrapped today. The story starts at our farm where these lambs have been raised for the last six to ten months. We haul them over the hill uh, into Butte. We're 30 miles away. And then we drop them off at the corrals here at Ranchland Packing. And the next, within a few hours usually, they're brought into the kill floor and slaughtered then. I want to make one mention, the way they're handled from the corrals to the kill floor is very important. There's stress that can be applied to the animals if they're mistreated. And so if your processor not treating the, the animals correctly and, ha and handling them humanely, the only advice I can give to you is try to work with the processor. If that doesn't work, then your only option is to find another processor. There's no excuse for mishandling. Justin, we'll have Justin here take it from the kill floor into the next two rooms where they're hung and aged. All right, thanks Dave. At Ranchland, uh, we're a slaughter facility and a processing facility. As Dave says, he drops them off here. Um, scheduling, as we always talk about here, is very important, um, especially with lamb more than I think any other uh, species. Um, these, this set of lamb, Dave dropped them off. We were able to run them right from his trailer right into the building. Um, they move so much easier if they don't have to sit around for a while. So. Scheduling makes it easy on us as well for the human handling aspect. Um, we are under USDA. USDA um, enforces what we say we're going to do. Um, human handling, like you said, is not it's not optional. It's um, it's a standard practice of our business and enforced by the USDA as well. After slaughter, the lamb are put into our drip cooler. One of the best advantage, one of the best things we have going at Ranchland is a separate drip cooler and dry age facility. That means that we have two different coolers. The first one, the carcasses go into and uh, intense refrigeration will evaporate the moisture out of them and drop the carcass temperature down to like 30 degrees overnight. That gives us the ability to roll them into the dry age cooler where we can let them hang um, like these lambs hung in seven days with no mold and really no signs of age on them. And that'll help increase the tenderness and also make the flavor more intense and, I guess, better flavor. This here is uh, one of our lambs. I just wanted to show you how each lamb is tagged as it flows through the plant. Here's my name, Dave Scott. 227 was the date that the lamb was uh, killed in the plant. This is the tag number of the lamb. That's our tag number that was has been on the lamb uh, since birth, and this is the hot weight of the carcass, 62 pounds. We generally have a 50% uh, difference between live animal weight and car carcass weight. I just want to say one thing about this tag number. Uh, this tag number follows this particular carcass all the way through the plant. It's a very important number. If there's a uh, uh, customer that, that bought this lamb as whole, then uh, this lamp, this, this ear tag number here is assigned to that customer. Likewise, if we want to have a particular cut, uh, for instance, shoulders, kebabs coming off this lamp, then that's part of the cutting order. Lamp 5097 goes to kebabs in the shoulders. We have two carcasses here. The main thing we want to show you right now is the difference between the two. The carcass on my closest to me here is finished just spot on. The one on 
this far side here is just a little bit over finished and we're going to let Wayne tell us what, how we're, what we're looking for here both inside and outside the car. Good morning. And I've worked with Dave for several years. As, as a producer, Dave generally drops his sheep off one day. He'll come in the next day and look over the carcasses. What we're looking for is fat cover, inside fat, and overall muscle buildup. So what we're looking at on the inside of this one is we have a little bit of heavy fat. This one here was just a little bit too long on uh, feed. For this one here, we have a perfect sheep. Interior fat, we don't have all that much. Exterior is just perfect. We had what something would be just broke down and packaged and ready to go to the market. And that's about two tenths of an inch of fat on the back fat there. That's an example. This end here is right around two tenths. Okay, we want to show the inside fat or the kidney fat right here. Um, we'll let Wayne tell what, what we kind of wanted to see and what we are seeing here and the reason why you want a little less kidney fat than this. Okay, your overall goal would be to have minimize your kidney fat without hurting the fat content for your marbling. So this one here has a little bit more kidney fat than your perfectly finished lamb. So when we break these lambs down, we will show you when we get to the shoulders, into the loins of the marbling, that you'll have about the same amount of marbling, but this kidney fat is overall waste. Okay, we're gonna start breaking the lamb here. Uh, we're gonna break the shoulders off first. The best place to break the shoulders off is right at the end of the shoulder blade so that we don't get into the loin too much. Uh, some of your chefs, your cooks, like a French cut loin, so we don't want to get too far off the loin. talk about the loin size, the ribeye size. This is your ribeye right here on both lambs. And we're gonna look at the marbling on both. This uh, lamb carcass right here weighs 79 pounds. And this lamb carcass here is 62 pounds. And as you can see, the ribeye is real close to the same size with a lot more waste on the larger lamb. And of course, on the shoulders too, you can see the excess fat this is our heavier carcass here, 79 pounds, and this is the lighter one, 62 pounds, where we're gonna have to trim a lot of, more of the excess fat off of the, the larger lamb. And you can see the interior fat is real similar. Okay, here we have an idea of the ki interior kidney fat after we have pulled it out. This is from the lamb that weighs 79 pounds, and this one is from the land that weighs 62 pounds. And as you can see, it's almost triple the size. 
Alright, Wayne's gonna separate the breast ribs from the, the ribs and loin combined still there. Removing some of that excess fat. on that piece there where you, the separation between the rib and the loin now that he's got it tripped out. Now he's chopping it. That's sirloin slash loin right on the border. And in my opinion, it was a perfect break. That's right where you want to hit it. Those are nice loin chops. See those loin chops over there, at least an inch and a half thick. Uh, chefs seem to prefer that. The portion size is better, and they usually cook up better without the risk of overcooking them. Uh, you can see he French, that's what we call a French rack, where he takes that meat out uh, in between the ends of the bones, uh, mostly for presentation. That thick meat in between those bones, by the time you cook it, would be pretty much inedible anyway as you try it out. Separate the leg. Put the high shank off. Sirloin is still attached to that leg. Where's the sirloin? I'll show the sirloin. Where the sirloin. Okay. That could be either left on the leg or taken off his chops, depending on the customer's request.
Okay, here we have your boneless shoulder, which you can we net and they're ready for roasting, or else we can cut them into uh, kebabs for kebab meat. One of our next steps in uh, processing lamb after we cut the chops or anything that is run through the saw, we like to scrape the, the final product to try and get rid of that excess. It, it would be similar to eating like a bone chip. So as you can see, we remove that excess bone dust. Then our next step would be on our boneless shoulders. We bone them out. You can leave them whole. This here we have cut in half and we run them through our netter to hold them together while the chef can cook. And then he can insert any of their spices through the netting. Okay, we're gonna touch a little bit more on the subject as an overall producer for Dave, that he comes in and checks out every lamb after slaughter. And what he's looking for mainly is a perfectly finished lamb where they do not get overfed which is a, uh, would be a main goal for a producer. So that when you do overfeed, it's just waste. You just trim and there's no use for it. So Dave comes in and checks every sheep after slaughter so that he can make sure that he is feeding them properly and that they're to the perfection that they want to be. This is Brenda Worley. She's the, uh, the meat packager and the quality control person here and also getting the uh, meat as soon as we can, right into the freezer. Okay, so what I do after Wayne or whoever gets done cutting the meat, I uh, usually start with the chops and scrape all the content of, from the bone dust off the lamb. It keeps it fresher. He usually wants four packs on his lambs. I use a four mil bag. It'll keep the freshness longer in the freezer and the bones won't pop through the bag. So it looks something like this before I vacuum pack it. And I always usually use a four mil bag for all of his product, even without the bone. It's a little bit thicker. It holds in freshness longer in the freezer. And the racks are also ready. So with these racks, the bones will always break the bag usually. So what I do is double it. Something like that. And also with, we're doing bone in light, sometimes he does boneless. He'll have a bone here and a really sharp bone here. Those usual will pop in the freezer, they get banged around, et cetera, et cetera. So I do the same. So something like that, and then we're ready to vacuum it. Okay, this is our vacuum hacker. Uh, both sides do work. Right now I'll just mainly be doing this. There's a heat bar right here. When I flip this over, it'll compact it. The air will suck it down and it will seal the product. Finally, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what processors expect of producers and how things go when there's correct communication. I wanted to mention one thing that uh, on the lines of communicating with your processor and 
is uh, when we had to travel over 30 miles to bring the lambs to the plant here, uh, we noticed when we first just aged the lambs for two to three days, we noticed that we didn't have the tenderness that we really wanted. And we communicated that to Justin. He says, okay, let's, let's work on this a little bit. So that's when we came up with the dry aging of seven days. And that produced the kind of really nice tender product that we were used to. And I just mentioned this because it's an example of communicating with the processor, which is really important. I'm going to let Justin tell you more. Okay, all right. Yeah, as Dave said, I, I agree. I think that, you know, relationship building and communication is the most important aspect of it. Um, if he doesn't tell us what he wants or his problems or his concerns, then we can't fix them. So he's got to, got to be able to communicate and give us the opportunity to, to fix what he's not happy with. And then on the other thing is, one of the things we fight most right now is scheduling. Um, a lot of the, the ranchers and producers, they don't understand that, that we're busy as well. And um, we run at capacity almost every day. And it's hard to sneak in one animal or two animals, if not impossible. So scheduling is very important. Um, payment is very important. If, um, if we're not getting paid promptly, we're not going to be doing business no more with that person. So, I mean, just, both ways. right. Uh, and on the subject of payment, uh, cash builds relationships. Uh, it, it begins relationships and it sustains them. So, cash is always a nice thing to use to build your relationship with your producer, with your process. I just wanted to thank Justin again at Ranchland Pack uh, yeah. for taking time. Thank you, Dave. He's got a busy schedule here, and we hope this video has helped you.